Hey there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now, the Raspberry Pi Foundation pleasantly surprised us this week when it launched the Raspberry Pi 4. Now, we weren't expecting it until next year, but apparently because Broadcom had such success in building the new processor for the board, they were able to bring the launch forward. Now, the Raspberry Pi 4 is a big upgrade compared to the Raspberry Pi 3. So, if you want to find out more, please let me explain. So what I'm going to do with this video is I'm going to split it into two parts. At the beginning of the video, I'm going to talk about why you want a Raspberry Pi. What is a Raspberry Pi? You've heard the name. What does it do? What's it all about? And I'll cover that quickly. And then in the second part, get into the details specifically about the Raspberry Pi 4. Now, if you want to jump over the introduction, I'll leave the time code in the uh, description below. But I'll also put it here on the screen now so that you can see it and just scroll forward to the bit where you want to get to. Okay, so what is a Raspberry Pi? So a Raspberry Pi is a single board computer. That means everything you need is on a single board that uses an ARM-based chip, which means you don't need uh, ventilation and huge fans on top of it. And basically it has three main purposes. The first is because it is a low power consumption unit, it can be used in all kinds of different situations where let's say a PC would not be uh, usable. For example, inside like little bits of robotics, uh, as a server that you want to have somewhere without ventilation, without special heating, uh, kind of, you know, for security webcams, for, you know, there's just so many different places where not having to have big power supplies, it runs off USB, which means it's kind of five volts and a few amps are needed. You don't need a ventilator, you don't need big fans, you don't need special cooling. And yet it comes with so many interesting things like uh, Wi-Fi and Ethernet and USB and so on. And we'll talk about that in a second. The second place it's really useful is if you want to just kind of get into hobbyist programming. So let's say you have someone uh, in your family or even yourself, you want to learn things like, let's say, Python or C programming or Rust or Golang or Java, whatever you want to use, but you don't want to occupy, let's say, the main PC or the laptop in the house. You want to be able to set up a, a monitor or a TV somewhere, plug in a mouse and keyboard along with a small board, and you've got yourself a whole little uh, development environment for learning about how software works uh, for programming and for things like Linux as well. You're able to play with that. And yet it's a very low cost of entry, $35 for the cheapest Raspberry Pi uh, 4 board that's just been released. And the third thing that's really useful for, as I alluded to in the first point, is you can actually interact with hardware. Now it has 40 GPIO pins, general purpose input output pins, and these can be connected to hardware. So for input, for example, you can have a temperature monitor or a humidity monitor. And also for output, you can control switches, you can control LEDs, you can even control stepper motors. And therefore it's great for actually seeing this interaction between hardware and software in all kinds of different projects, including robotic projects, including uh, ecological systems, and weather monitoring systems, anything that you want to do and you can program the system itself or because the ecosystem is so diverse nowadays, there are kits available in terms of software and the hardware that you can just get, plug it all in and you've got yourself, I saw the other day, a, a wildlife monitor. You can have like a little camera and it can record things, detects motion and then just takes a photograph when it sees motion. So you can set that up with a battery somewhere out uh, you know, near your house and then come back after a few days and see all the different wildlife that you've captured, all just using this small single board computer. So it's worth quickly just mentioning the different types of Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi 1, 2, 3, and now 4 are this kind of size, that credit card kind of size that come with, you know, kind of Ethernet ports and so on, all built into it here, HDMI ports and USB ports, and the latest models will have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And it's this kind of size, and there are cases for it and, and all that kind of stuff. And they start at about $35, and then with the Raspberry Pi 4, that goes up depending on how much RAM you want to put into it. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But there's also the Raspberry Pi Zero and the Zero W, which is a much, much smaller device. And these kind of cost like $5 or $10. But as you can see, very, very few ports. In fact, the pins aren't even populated here on the board. But this gets up and running, gets you up and running with Linux. You can even have a desktop on it. And if you want to solder in your own pins, you can definitely start doing that hardware stuff on it. So basically, the credit card side one or the very, very tiny one, slight different in price, however, all still a Raspberry Pi, all running basically, fundamentally the same software. 
Okay, so let's talk about the Raspberry Pi 4. Now the Raspberry Pi 4 is a huge upgrade compared to the Raspberry Pi 3 and the 3 Plus. First of all, the CPU has had a major upgrade. Previously, it was a quad-core CPU using the Cortex-A53. But now we're using a quad-core processor again, but now it's the Cortex-A72. Now these really are two very different beasts in terms of performance. Now, according to the testing that I've done, very broadly, the A72 setup is three times faster than the A53 setup. So a Raspberry Pi 4 will be three times faster than a Raspberry Pi 3. And that's in everything, including in the desktop, including in internet, including in kind of compiling programs, in absolutely everything, it is at least three times faster. One other thing to mention in terms of performance is I set this up as a Samba server. I connected a 500 gigabyte SSD, external SSD over USB 3, and I was able to transfer files to and from the Raspberry Pi at over 100 megabytes a second, which actually is pretty good and the same as what I get on anything else in my network. So if you wanna use one of these as a file server using USB 3 external hard drives, that's definitely a much better option now than it was previously with the Raspberry Pi 3 and the 3 Plus. Now, if that wasn't enough, we've also got now USB 3. So we've got an upgrade from USB 2 to USB 3. And the bandwidth, the internal buses have also been upgraded so it can cope with that high level of data. And also we have true gigabit ethernet, although we kind of had gigabit ethernet with the Raspberry Pi 3 Plus. This is now true gigabit ethernet, again, because the internal buses have been upgraded to be able to handle that amount of traffic. So a new processor, USB 3, we've also got um, gigabit ethernet, there's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5 also built in on board. But one of the great options now about the Raspberry Pi is you can pick boards with different amounts of RAM. Up until now, we only ever had half a gigabyte or one gigabyte of RAM, and that was your maximum. Now, if you were doing command line stuff or very, very easy desktop stuff, one gigabyte would see you through. However, it didn't take long to open up a couple of tabs in the web browser or open up, let's say, LibreOffice and kind of that RAM would start to get consumed. However, now there is a one gigabyte version which still costs that same $35 or the equivalent in your local currency, for example, in the UK, it was always 35 pounds. And then there is now also a two gigabyte version and a four gigabyte version. Now I've got both a four gigabyte and two gigabyte version, and I'll talk about the differences between them in just a moment. There are a couple of other changes that occurred going from the three to the Raspberry Pi four. First is that we have no longer got uh, full-size HDMI plugs on here, it's now micro HDMI. So it's not even the same as what's on the Raspberry Pi Zero, but the size down even smaller, kind of really tiny, even smaller than uh, micro USB. But because they've been able to reduce that down in size, there are now actually two HDMI ports, which means you can actually power two monitors simultaneously using a Raspberry Pi 4, which I think is a great idea. And the other change is that we've now moved from micro USB for powering the board to USB-C. And the reason for this is because over the USB-C, they can actually, while staying within the correct specifications defined by the standard, they can actually ask for more power. And that more power can then also be transferred to the USB 2 and the USB 3 ports that are actually or connected to the board. So if you are connecting in peripherals, let's say like an external hard drive, and you're using a good power supply, you can now get all the current through to the USB 3 ports that you need. Other than that, the Raspberry Pi 4 follows the same model and styling of the Raspberry Pi 3 and the Raspberry Pi 2 before it. You've got, for example, that connector where you can connect in a Raspberry Pi camera, you've got an audio jack, you've got the slot for the micro SD card, and all the things that we're used to with the Raspberry Pi. So as I said earlier, the Raspberry Pi 4 gives you a three times performance increase, which means when you go over to the desktop, for the first time, you're actually getting a reasonable desktop experience. So I actually forced myself to use the Raspberry Pi for a few hours, I abandoned my desktop, and for all the web-based stuff that I was doing, I had maybe five or six tabs open, I had a few other programs running, I was able to use the Raspberry Pi reasonably well as a desktop. Now it isn't as fast, it isn't as fast as a leading Windows desktop. It's not going to be. I mean, if you think about it nowadays, you can get kind of, you know, 16 
uh, core Threadripper, AMDs, whatever. So there is going to be a difference in the performance. But if you dial things back and say, what's it like compared to, let's say, a second-hand PC from a few years ago or a second-hand laptop, then the Raspberry Pi is definitely going to be in that kind of ballpark. Now, of course, everybody's usage is different. However, I actually found it pleasantly surprising. You still do get those few moments where you click on something and it doesn't come up as quick as you want. You're kind of like going, oh, come on, come on, come on. And that may be to do because of the SD card speed. It may be because of other things that are going on. So it's not lightning fast, but it's reasonable and there and it's usable. However, the amount of memory you choose will definitely be important. I've tried both the two gigabyte and four gigabyte versions on the desktop. It really does matter to how much stuff do you want to have open at once. If you do have just Gmail, let's say one of your social media sites, Facebook or Twitter open, and then maybe an IDE for doing some Python programming, then it's going to work absolutely fine in two gigabytes. If you want to start pushing it and having, you know, dual monitors and you want kind of a web browser open in this window and you want an, uh, an IDE open in this monitor and you want to kind of want other programs running in the background, some music playing and, you know, you've got other things going on, then obviously four gigabytes is going to be better than two gigabytes. So it really does depend on your budget. If you are looking to do desktop stuff and you've got the extra cash, definitely go for the four gigabyte version. If you just want actually, uh, you're good with the Raspberry Pi 3 and it's been doing everything you wanted because you're not doing much desktop stuff, you're using it for you know, air pollution monitoring or whatever, but you want a bit more speed, a bit more performance, then you can get the one gigabyte version, which still costs the same money uh, as the Raspberry Pi 3 did. And if you want to treat yourself, well then go and get that two gigabyte version. But for me, when I'm buying future ones of these, unless they're running, let's say, in a cluster or something, I'm gonna get the four gigabyte version because it's just nice. Now, the great thing, of course, about the Raspberry Pi is the ecosystem is there and it's already established and the Raspberry Pi 4 is completely compatible with everything that goes on with the Raspberry Pi 3. In fact, I took my Adafruit uh, Pi OLED screen and I connected it up to my Raspberry Pi 4, downloaded the drivers, typed in the uh, Python script that they give there as an example, and I was able to get it up and running in next to no time. However, just an interesting little point, that particular library, and I'm sure this was just about this particular library, only recognized the four gigabyte version of the board. I actually had to go in and just tweak something to make it recognize the two gigabyte version, and I did actually post a bug uh, report on the uh, relevant library. And I'm sure that will get fixed in next to no time because the Raspberry Pi 4 support was already there. It's just that there was a difference between how the two gigabyte and the four gigabyte version work. But the point is, is that in terms of the compatibility with all the existing gadgets out there, all the displays and sensors and motors and everything like that, all the Python scripts, all the things you want, it's all completely compatible, which is absolutely brilliant. You don't have to start scratching your head trying to work out how to get the Raspberry Pi 4 working in your existing environments for your Raspberry Pi 3 and so on. Having said that, there is one actual downside to this great compatibility, and that is that Raspberry Pi is still running in 32-bit mode. So the Cortex A53 and the Cortex A72 are 64-bit processors. And at the moment, they're stuck in their 32-bit mode. Now, that doesn't seem to be affecting the performance much at the moment, and the Raspberry Pi Foundation have done different testings over the years to see whether it's worth moving over to 64-bit, and that hasn't yet happened. However, of course, I'm pretty sure that you will be able to get other distributions, let's say Armbian or Arch or something like that, for the Raspberry Pi 4 that will run it in native 64-bit mode. But if you're running Raspbian because it wants to remain compatibility way back with the Raspberry Pi 0, in fact, all the way through to the Raspberry Pi 4, it's still in 32-bit mode. Because the advantage, you could take a binary compiled in Golang you know, on a Raspberry Pi 4 and take it over to uh, a Raspberry Pi 3 and run it and you wouldn't have any problems. Now, there are two things that I have found negative about the Raspberry Pi 4. And although I absolutely love the Raspberry Pi 4, I have to tell you about these two things. First of all, it doesn't do 4K video decoding. Although I pretty sure it supports 4K screens in terms of resolution. I don't have a 4K monitor, so I couldn't test it, but that shouldn't be a problem. However, displaying 4K video doesn't work. And actually, when I tried it, it kind of just freezes. You get like big gaps of several seconds between any frame that comes up. You can get artifacts. 
and I tried it with H.264 and H.265 and basically I, it doesn't work at all. However, the good news is for 1080p, obviously for 720p and 480p, all that kind of stuff, it works absolutely fine. You can take a full HD movie, play it on a Raspberry Pi and it will work absolutely great. 4K content, 4K video decoding, does not work on the Raspberry Pi, although a 4K screen, a 4K display, will work for the desktop. And the other negative thing I have to mention is that this Raspberry Pi gets hot. Now, the other Raspberry Pis, I've never had any kind of issue with them getting warm. No matter what I'm doing on them, no matter how hard I'm pushing them, they never get hot. Occasionally, I would see an under voltage problem where my power supply wasn't matching the draw of current that you had on the board because of the extra peripherals I had connected. But with the Raspberry Pi 4, it is a daily occurrence that you'll get an over temperature warning. And actually when that happens, a little thermometer uh, appears on the screen on top of the desktop, or kind of overlaid on the desktop to show you that it's doing it. And there's also something written into the log file. Now, when you push this thing, all four cores are churning away, doing hard work, the temperature goes right up. And in fact, the whole board gets hot. Even the USB, the metal around the USB, the metal around the, uh, the ethernet port, actually they can be quite hot to touch. And if you pick up just the board in your hand, you can feel the heat coming off it. Now, it doesn't stop functioning when you have that overheating problem, but I'm pretty sure it must bring down the clock speed significantly while it waits for the chip to cool down. So that's something just to be aware of. So in summary, what can we say? Well, in terms of pricing, that base model one gigabyte is exactly the same price as the Raspberry Pi 3, which makes it a perfect upgrade to the existing Raspberry Pi 3 because you're not paying any more money, but you're getting so much more. You're getting gigabit ethernet, you're getting USB 3, you're getting that performance uplift in terms of the CPU. You've got built-in Bluetooth 5, you've got Wi-Fi and so on. And also, if you want to pay a bit extra money, you've now got this lovely option of having two gigabytes or even better, four gigabytes of RAM on your Raspberry Pi. Only thing to be careful of is that it can overheat and don't expect to be able to use it for 4K video decoding. Okay, that's it. My name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please do give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. And uh, well, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.